My name is Courtney Dogger, and I'm the president of Network 2020. Um, it's a real pleasure that we have uh, uh, Britt Grossman here today um, to, to talk to us about the environmental impacts of uh, COVID-19. Um, just really quickly beforehand, uh, for those of you who don't know about Network 2020, we're a New York-based organization that tries to create more informed conversations around global affairs. And uh, since the pandemic, we've, like everyone else, have switched to online. Um, but what has been wonderful about that is that it has removed geographic constraints. And so we're, we're pleased to, um, to make some of these briefings open to people around the world. Um, and you can find out more on our website, network2020.org. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, who you'll be able to hear from today. So Britt is the VP for Global Climate at the Environmental Defense Fund's Climate Program, where she oversees their climate work, shaping their advocacy for environmentally effective and economically sound climate policies outside of the US. Um, she set up the EDF's European office in London and has established a program with operations in Sweden, UK, Spain, and Brussels. And as the uh, European director for EDF's ocean program, uh, she uh, had led EDF's work on common fisheries policy reform in Brussels and simultaneously worked on the ground in various EU member states with fishermen and local NGO partners on co-management processes and sustainable management of fisheries. And until August of 2011, she was the managing director of the Office of Economic Policy and Analysis of the EDF. Um, and she has worked with the economics team on a broad range of issues, including water and ecosystem markets, nitrogen pollution, and climate policy. And prior to the EDF, she worked as an economist in London. Um, so she is very well versed to, to speak today about the economic impacts of uh, COVID-19 on the environment, um, the environmental impacts of COVID-19, apologies. Um, and just a reminder about asking questions. So at any point, if you would like to ask a question, you can uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, you can also raise your hand to be unmuted, um, or you can email Brian at bthang at network2020.org and, um, and he can put the question in the queue for you. Um, and just a, if you raise your hand to be unmuted, um, that, that's basically an indication that you'd like to ask the question live and we can do that as well. Um, so really, just to, just to set up the, the um, why we wanted to reach out to Britt, you know, as, as I'm sure many of you have realized, as we've been on lockdown for a couple of months now, um, it's it's hard not to escape the articles of um, you know before and after pictures of of cities around the world that are dealing with you know better air quality now, um, or seeing animals in places where they haven't been in quite some time. Even even myself, I took a drive about a month ago down the empty streets of New York that which were overtaken by flocks of pigeons. Um, so 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 there's clearly um, really visible effects of of the reduction in activity. Um, but you know, I think the real question is um, is what you know whether these impacts will remain. And so, you know, I'd just like to start off, Britt, just um, from your perspective, um, you know, how has this crisis in, uh, impacted the environment, and do you think that these impacts will last? Um, well, thank you so much, Courtney. First of all, um, thank you for having me. It's a great honor to speak to you and to your network um, and about something that's very close to my heart. So I'm looking forward to this discussion today. Um, as you say, yes, we, we've, uh, we've seen it all around us, um, either in real life or in media. We've seen um, kangaroos jumping around um, High Street in Adelaide and um, wild goats in, 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 in Wales in the city centers, which is, is great fun. And that just shows that, I guess, when it comes at least to biodiversity and uh, wildlife, they are just lurking around the corner for us to get out of the way and they'll, they'll come back in. And, uh, that's, that's a really good thing to see. Um, of course, environmental impacts is very, very broad. It's a very broad term, right? Um, you know, it goes from wildlife and where we can find them to, uh, um, you know, to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is a lot less obvious for us to, 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 to know whether that's going up or down. Um, 
what we've seen for sure is um, that um, the individual, so really this was individuals stopping our daily life, right? You and I, we're, we're kind of speaking to each other from our homes because we're not getting on the subway or getting in a car to go to work. Um, and we are really uh, just sort of hunkering down. And so our personal footprint is definitely reduced in terms of traffic. So traffic is one of the most obvious things we've seen um, being reduced in big cities. And um, so the impact that traffic normally has obviously have been reduced. So um, nitrogen dioxide, um, PM 2.5, which is like soot, all the sort of dirty black things that come out of cars, that has been dramatically reduced. Um, and that's why for the first time in, I think almost a century, um, people in Punjab um, in Northern India could actually see the Himalayas. Like they could actually see the Himalayas like 200 kilometers away, which normally is like hidden in what they would call a nice fog, but it's just dirty smog really. Um, similarly in a lot of other cities. So that has definitely reduced and that's a great thing, um, but it's temporary, right? Um, we are all hopeful that we'll be able to resume some kind of semblance of normal life quite soon. And so what we're seeing, for instance, in China, in Beijing right now, is where they've reopened um, life, as, as it were, is that actually traffic has gotten worse. And I think that's quite, we could expect that. I think I'm also a little bit nervous to get back on a crowded subway in New York. Like we're all talking about physical distancing as the one thing we need to do not to get the virus. So do you want to get back into a crowded subway car? No, people who have the option, middle-class people are all going to be getting into their private cars. And so in Beijing, traffic's up by 50%. It's traffic jams, it's, it's bad. Um, and that's gone quite quickly. You know, um, lockdown is finished and, and they're back there. But um, what it shows is that it's really going to come down to how the government reacts to it. So when it comes to our individual actions, we are all going to try and do the best for ourselves. We're all kind of selfish beings to a degree. We don't want to get sick. We don't want to make our family sick. And so we'll be getting in a private car if it shows that we can do it. Cities like London, Milan, and a couple of other cities around the world are already starting to close down streets or closing down parking places for cars. So they are taking a government approach to reducing the traffic. Um, they are going to try and get more bikes on the road um, and stuff like that. So if it's up to you or me, we'll probably just do what's easy, um, but government response is gonna be really important. Looking at some other things, um, one of the things that I thought was really amazing was the blue water in the canals of Venice, right? How beautiful. I was there just last summer. It was murky black water. I mean, Venice is still gorgeous, but the water itself wasn't gorgeous. Um, now you can, it's, 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 it's transparent. However, unless um, the water taxis start running on a different fuel, we're just going to see that straight away again. Right. I mean, it's not going to it's not going to change. So what we really need is a systematic change. Um, and I don't think we're going to see that just through uh, personal actions um, anytime soon, unfortunately. So. And, and, and just to, to follow up on that, do you see um, do you think that there will be that that government will or or push back from the people who are now saying hey you know i love being able to see these you know blue, beautiful blue canals or you know whatever it is in, in whatever country you know do, do do you do you think that those conversations will be had or is it sort of you know once once it's gone you know we're just going to focus on on getting the economy back at, at whatever yeah you know. so um it's a really tricky question right uh people are we're in the middle of a crisis um, people are suffering in terms of heartache of people getting sick, people losing family. Um, but what's around the corner is in a way, but possibly more crisis, more frightening. It's a huge economic crisis that is coming our way fast. Um, it's going to be different to the crisis of 2009 and the oil shocks, but it's going to be dramatic. We're all expecting a really big economic slump. Um, right now, every country is um, trying to figure out what to do. Um, and trying to see how they can avoid the worst. The way I think about it is, and I don't know if this is correct in terms of economic um, jargon, but I think about currently all governments are looking at relief efforts. And with relief efforts, I mean things like manufacturing more masks, but also giving um, loan extensions, um, providing 
unemployment benefits. That's like a relief effort. That's really looking at the here and now, how do we take care of that? Then we're going to have recovery efforts, which is really trying to help recover a little bit of the economy. And that's, again, to me, that looks like next six months, depending on how long the crisis will last. Because let's say six months after the worst of the crisis, which could actually take us to the end of 2022. You know, if we're hearing what they're saying about the immunization, we might be, you know, this time next year, so then next six months. And then we'll see what are the real stimulus packages. And that's really trying to get the economy back up, trying to create jobs. And so um, I'm worried that right now, the relief and recovery efforts, it's all just about trying, climbing on to the jobs that we have, trying to stop people from starving, because, you know, like, I'm, I'm really privileged. I'm in my apartment in New York. I can work from home. Um, even in New York, not a lot of people have that privilege. And once we go to developing countries, I mean, it's, you know, it's a humanitarian crisis waiting to happen and already happening in certain places. So um, relief efforts are necessary, but often um, governments just go for what they know works and what they've been doing before, rather than making the structural change, which is really necessary to see the environmental impacts that we, we are looking for. Um, Beijing, not only are people back in their cars, the, um, the, uh, the factories are churning again. And what looked like, um, like a huge slump of factory output, percentage-wise, like 10, 15 percent, um, over a year, it looks like it's only going to be 1 percent, because what they are doing is they are trying to churn out more than they would have done before. So they're trying to make up for lost time. And with that come all the environmental costs. So. I see. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. The, I, I think that the, the graphs on this one will be interesting after the fact, a big downturn and then a big uptick. Um, so, um, so, so with that said, you know, what, you know, from your vantage point, what are some of the markers or indicators that, that you would be looking for to, to see, um, to assess the direction that, that the climate change mitigation efforts would be um, following to, to make sure that, you know, from, from, you know, what I'm sure that what you want to see is both, you know, the, the health and safety of everyone around the world, but that also includes looking down the road um, and trying to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So, so, so what would you be looking for to, to see if you're on the direction that you want to be on? Well, so obviously we're looking, we're looking at the data right now. Like you said, looking at data is going to be really interesting. And everybody who works in my field this is like a data geek sort of bonanza, right? <laughs> Everybody's looking at everything, analyzing health impacts and all kinds of impacts. And a lot of it is unknown. This crisis is unlike the other crises because this is not about, you know, subpar mortgages. This is a, a, an actual physical shock where people just stopped working, which we've, we've not seen that before. So uh, we don't know what the playbook will be. Um, so in terms of... For instance, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, what um, the IEA, International Energy Agency, is predicting at the moment, but all of it depends on how long the pandemic will last, is a 4 to 7% reduction in CO2 emissions this year, um, which is great. Unfortunately, it's not actually enough. And that's what really shows the challenge that we have in front of us. Um, if, if all of us feel like our lives have been so disrupted how can that not be enough, be enough? Well, I'll tell you why, or some of the reasons why. We're still eating, right? So all the emissions that come from agriculture, which is a fair share, I'm just looking, it's, uh, what is it? it's about 21% of greenhouse gas emissions at the moment. Um, much of that is still happening. You and I are speaking via the wonderful web, which is run on electricity. So electricity power plants are still churning. Power plant reduction was actually quite minimal because um, the reduced um, energy demand was for some factories, but um, household use was as high as ever, if not higher. Um, and so it all really depends on where that energy came from, right? If these were power plants, you know, if you and I are speaking th through the web um, on a coal plant generated electricity, that's not good. And that hasn't changed. Uh, again, I live in Manhattan. I've looked around you know, these big fancy gyms, they're closed. They have been closed for three months. The lights are on day and night. So we haven't been doing really, you know, so our life has been disrupted completely, but actually the sources 
that um, contribute to overall greenhouse gas emissions are not affected as much as we think at first sight. So what's really been reduced is personal transport, right? Flights, you know, have gone down dramatically, um, depending on different countries, depending on the lockdown, depending on sort of um, travel bans, et cetera. But like, let's say 50%, that's huge. That's a huge impact. Um, the um, cars have gone down a lot, huge impact, but there I really do fear that the bounce back effect might be bigger than what it was before. So what we're really looking at when we're looking at climate impacts, we're not looking at what it was in one month, but the cumulative impact, right? So CO2 emissions, once they, go, once they go in the atmosphere, they stay there for hundreds of years. It doesn't matter that it was a little bit lower in February and March. If you make up for it in May and June, it doesn't matter. Um, so um, what am I going to be looking for in markets? What we really need is structural change, right? And unfortunately, um, I mean, okay, positive glasses, pink glasses on for me. Um, the world has seen how we can look different. Um, Delhi has seen clean skies for the first time in forever. Um, Venice is seeing blue water. Uh, we're seeing what the future could look like, a, a more fossil free future could look like. Let's try and keep that. However, people are losing their jobs. People are at risk of starving. Um, that's a very stark contrast. And we all know that people have um, short-term needs are more important than long-term needs. We know climate change is real. We know it's a crisis that's coming at us. And there's a lot of similarities with sort of pandemics. But the crisis of not having a job and being hungry is a crisis today. And people will always take today over tomorrow. So um, there is a real movement in certain governments and in, with certain um, leaders. Um, there's a, it's called a Build Back Better movement. I mean, you can even sort of the hashtag goes on, on Twitter, Build Back Better. Um, a lot of European politicians have really asked for it. Um, a lot of other countries, I mean, I just saw Canada just um, put some environmental strings on their relief packages, meaning if you're a company and you want to get some of the relief packages, you have to, you know, give something in return. You have to sort of, um, in this case, carbon disclosure, disclosure of at least of your emissions and stuff. So there's little steps. Uh, but what we really need, um, and this is where I get on my soapbox, is, um, is, a, is a price on carbon. That's what we really need. Um, whether it's an overt price in terms of a, a carbon tax, or whether it's just um, a limit, like we're not going to emit more than that, and then that will trickle tr through and a price will be set. Um, one or the other could work. If you look at um, the emission patterns over the last hundreds of years, the biggest slumps were not in the 2009 crisis, which was a crisis that was not led by a pricing effect, but it was the oil crisis. The oil crisis, where we did see a real price effect, was the one that actually had behavioral change. Cars got smaller, cars got more efficient. So manufacturers actually changed products for consumers to use in response to a structural change. I'm scared that that's not what we're seeing today. And in fact, um, unfortunately, a lot of leaders are using the crisis right now as an excuse, as a cover under the night, as I would call it, to do things that are really bad for the environment. Um, deforestation is up, which is shocking, right? Because nobody's looking. Everybody's looking at COVID. Nobody's looking at what's going on in the Amazon and in Indonesia. Deforestation is up by something like 150%. This is scary. This is because of a lack of enforcement. This is because the world's view is not on it and people are taking advantage of it. This is really scary. Here in the US, the government is trying rollback after rollback of environmental regulation right now, this week, and we're not paying attention. We, the media, are not paying enough attention because we're only talking about COVID. Um, and if we, you know, me being part of an environmental movement were to say something about it, we would get attacked for being insensitive and not trying to get the economy to go back up, which is quite unfair because they're trying to undo regulations that have been set for many, many years and that we know have um, economic impacts as well um, in terms of health benefits, et cetera. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox for a second and let you ask your next question. Sorry about that. I can no, go on forever. I mean, that, well, 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 that was terrific. And actually, I might... Um... 
I might just just kind of want to want to follow on that just a little bit, because you bring up an interesting point. I think about the about the need to get governments together, and I think you know one one thing that I've been one thing that I've been hearing is that you know there's a lot in this crisis that is um, because it's global that is similar to to climate change, and so you know I'm curious to hear whether or not there are any lessons that are being drawn from. Um, from the um, from from climate change that are being used in in the pandemic in terms of bringing the international community together or vice versa um, and and you know what, what whether whether you see any connections there very strong connections and again I'm afraid I've left my left my pink glasses at home because all I can think about is negative things I mean what we've seen with the pandemic is the G7 did not get their act together the G20 did not get their act together. Countries did not sign on to UN Secretary General Guterres' request for a ceasefire. Those were three big multilateral opportunities and they all failed. They all failed. Um, and that's really scary because that's the kind of thing we would need to have a real climate impact. Um, well, if, you, if you've been working in climate issues for a while, like I have, you find out all the excuses. The excuses for not doing something are always the same. Um, national governments are worried that they will lose competition. Um, they will lose their competitive edge on other countries. Their companies will no longer be able to export, etc. cetera. Um, so what you need is you need countries to work together and to say we'll set a common baseline so everybody goes in the same direction therefore the competitive effects will not be as distorted and that's you know i i, I see the argument of course you know you don't want to tank your own economy for something that is a global effect and has global causes i get it but the solution is not to be more insular and to get more sort of like down the barriers. The, the solution is really to, to sort of work together. Um, I've been really disappointed and worried about um, where multilateralism is going. Um, I think um, the UN and other bodies have a really big uphill struggle to um, stay relevant and to get member states to really engage. Um, I think that's what's needed both for this pandemic um, and we're failing, but it's definitely what's needed for climate. Um, you may have seen sort of the, the COP, so the, conference, so the UN FCC every year does the Conference of Parties, which is where uh, countries get together to talk about climate, and this has led to the Paris Agreement um, and uh, things like that. Um, this year there was supposed to be a COP in, uh, every year it's around the end of the year, so it was, I think, November, December. It was supposed to be in Glasgow in the UK, and it's been um, moved to 21, probably going to be moved to the end of 21. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and um, obviously, I think they recognize that most countries do not have their mind sort of switched on to look at climate change because there's so many other things going on. Um, and one of the things that was happening because of that, so, so let me just take a step back. One of the things that we're hoping to see at the next COP, and that is really about this multilateral agreement and countries trying to sort of see, find common ground and get at this together, was what's called the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs. So every country under the Paris Agreement will submit um, their plans for meeting Paris targets. Um, and um, many countries were due this year to submit their second NDC, and so their new plan. And obviously, the, the desire and the wish has been for the past year and a half that those would be more ambitious, right? So everybody's kind of, you know, trying to rally people up. What we've seen in sort of February, I think February, March, sort of around when the pandemic was really taking hold around the world, um, is that a couple of countries were trying to, were starting to submit, but they were submitting either the same targets as before, so no ambition, or they were not submitting at all. So people were very reluctant. So I think the fact that the COP got pulled is a good thing, because it'll give us a little bit more time to work on the arguments for um, why ambition is a good thing and why it's it's needed for climate change and it can be a good thing for the economy. So I think what we're all looking at now, um, me as a sort of environmental economist, sort of those two things together is what could look like a green recovery, right? So where are the big job creation options that are also good for the environment? 
I think that's where we need to look. We need to look at fiscal stimulus packages that will um, prioritize green recovery over gray recovery, as I may call it that. And we need to be very careful not to lock ourselves in now. So one sort of knee jerk reaction could be that you build a couple more factories, you build a couple more power plants with existing outdated fossil fuel technology. Those will then be around for 10 to 20 years. So that's what I mean by you lock yourself in or you build new transmission lines or you build, you know, pipelines that are really um, catering to um, a sort of strong fossil fuel future. Um, and that would really sort of lock us into a future that we don't want. But the economics of that would then dictate that they probably would stay around for a long time. So that's a bit worrying. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And so, you know, I think we'll, we'll turn to the Q&A shortly. So again, if, if any people have any questions, you know, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. But, but my next question, um, I think you touched on this in, in your answer in the last question, but one of the common themes that I've been hearing in all of these conversations that we've been having with different experts on different topics, whether it's humanitarian aid, whether it's development, is that um, there, there are two main trends that are happening. And one, one is that this pandemic has um, sh it has shown light in the cracks of a system that's already been there, and so um, and so it, it's just stressed. Um, it's stressed, and 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 one can see more easily where the gaps are and where the problems are. And then on the other hand, the pandemic has also accelerated some trends that were already in motion. Um, and it seems like that that might be happening as well in the climate mitigation efforts, or at least the, the governmental efforts. But I'd be curious to to hear whether or not you're seeing that um, across the board as well yeah. in the environment. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think some of the cracks that, that have always been there, unfortunately, um, are sort of the lack of government commitment, right? And um, this, this need for a multilateral um, approach and solution. And definitely those cracks are shown to be, you know, blown wide open and all our worst fears are kind of coming true in terms of if even a pandemic can't get the G7 or G20 people to agree on a statement, um, we we're in a bad place right now. Um, it also shows that um, a lot of multilateral efforts are not going to work without US leadership. I mean, let's just call it what it is. Um, Europe is trying really hard. I think uh, China and India are kind of waiting in the wings, seeing which way they can go. Uh, but without U.S. leadership or um, with actual vetoes of U.S., uh, multilateralism is really, really struggling right now. Um, so that's a crack. Um, and uh, but I want I want to sort of end before the Q and A with with you know with the opportunity. There is an opportunity. There is going to be so much money flowing into economies because of stimulus packages from um, development banks, from IMF from national governments. If that is done with a real deliberate um, wish for structural change, this is the time. Like we're really at sort of a fork in the road. Like you, 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 you will never have a fork like this again. Depending on whether I'm feeling positive or negative is where I'll be like, oh, 50, 50 shot will go this way or that way. Um, but really there's a huge opportunity and I wish um, more um, leaders could see the opportunity that a green future can give us, um, both just for the planet, but also for the economy. There's some really amazing multipliers out there in terms of job creation, good jobs um, for rebuilding uh, a green infrastructure, which is huge. I mean, if you're thinking about a Marshall Plan kind of effort, I mean, we are thinking about really sort of massive infrastructure projects. So. I'll leave it on the positive note. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's a good note and it, and it echoes what we heard from the, um, from Ahuna Eziakonwa, who's the director of UNDP's Africa Bureau. And, and you know, she sees a real opportunity that, you know, one can, you know, with, with this fork in the road, you know, really build back better, like you said. And so I think that, um, you know, but it takes that, I, I do think it takes that collective action, but as you point out, I think if anything, we've seen just the ability of um, 
of people and organizations to to make really swift change. It's it's uncomfortable, but you know we've been forced into it and we've adapted, and so maybe maybe now's the time. So yeah. <laughs> hopefully we'll take the, the the hopeful note. So we have a couple of yeah. qu questions coming in, so um, I'll take them as they come right now. So the first is. Um, Someone says that they've heard some people say that the virus is directly linked to the way we have abused the environment. Do you think this claim has merit? And if so, could you explain the connection between the two? Um, thank you. Great question. Um, I, th I think so, yes. So um, there is um, much evidence to be seen, and I'm not a virologist and whatever, but um, it does seem that um, the way we are treating wildlife right now is um, leading to new viruses coming to the fore that we haven't, um, that we wouldn't have been in touch with before, right? Um, and whether they are sort of viruses that are basically jumping species from, from other animals to us is definitely very scary. Uh, the more we do deforestation, the more we go into sort of dark jungles where we haven't been before, the more all those kind of things might come to us. So that's specifically for this virus. Um, other viruses as well, I was actually living in Brazil three years ago, um, was it four years ago now, uh, when Zika uh, reared its ugly head, um, uh, mosquito-borne disease. Um, and, you know, with climate change, we, we might see more Zika and God knows, maybe malaria in, in the US, in, in Florida and places. Um, so there's definitely strong connections. Um, we've also, again, I wouldn't put all my money on it because people are researching it right now, but there's been um, links shown between um, how people react to COVID and other viruses and their preconditions, including how they've been exposed to air quality before, right? If you look at maps of the air quality in Milan, before the virus hit, um, it was atrocious. I mean, it's one of the biggest red spots on the earth in terms of um, local air quality index. Um, and people were very, very badly um, affected. Too early to say if there's a link, but it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility um, that if you already have sort of a, a weaker chest, then of course a chest infection is gonna sort of get you really badly, so. It's remarkable how how so much how everything is so interconnected and sometimes it seems like the answers are so obvious but yet it's it's really hard to execute um, and what an irony too that at the time of um you know a possible link with the deforestation it's it's increasing so um so our next question uh says you know thank you very much for the insightful discussion i've studied the northeast atlantic fisheries commission a little as a researcher so it's exciting to hear your experience in european fishing policy how do you think the virus will affect North Atlantic fisheries, both in terms of the rejuvenation of stocks and the future competition in the area when this is all over? Hmm. Wow. Um, I could talk about climate change and the fisheries. Um, the virus, I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know how, if any effect there will be in the short term on how fishing was done there. Um, I have not seen evidence to lead me to believe that fishing has gone down. Um, so I think fishermen were still out on their boats. Um, fishing pressure was what it was before. Uh, so I'm not sure there's a direct link between the virus and the fishing. Um, what is happening though is that uh, climate change itself is um, warming up um, our oceans and that is pushing fish stocks away from the from the equator. So what's happening is fish stock are moving up and down. So um, the, so you, there's going to be more fish in the North Atlantic, which um, is great for the fishermen who fish there, uh, but might lead to some what we call fishing wars because of the way um, countries have agreements on who can fish what stock in what place. Um, it's actually something that a lot of my colleagues are looking at very closely. It's happening all around the world. So China, South Korea, um, all Europe countries. Um, there might be a lot of conflict over who gets to fish that fish that is now moving. Um, and obviously it is also quite worrying for countries around the equator that their fish stock will be moving away. And those tend to be countries that are already poor where fishing is done for subsistence reasons. So a lot of worrying effects directly linked to climate change. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so, so the next question coming in, and just a reminder, um, you can type in a question in the Q&A box, you can raise your hand, you can email Brian, 
um, and we'll get your question asked. So the, the next question asks, do you think there will be a greater willingness in the future to discuss environmental regulations within the US government in light of these very obvious environmental developments? And I assume those obvious environmental developments are related to the impacts that we're seeing now. Um, big sigh, I wish, right? I wish, I think it's gonna depend on what happens in the November elections. Uh, because right now um, EPA is really taking a, taking a hacking knife to, to environmental regulations. So um, as I said, um, the current crisis is used as an excuse for um, lowering standards and, and make, making it easier for people to have a normal life. Um, and um, car standards is, is, is one, one of those um, as a result. result. Um, I think it's, I mean, I hate to say it, but I think it's going to depend on whether there's uh, a regime change um, in the White House. Um, otherwise, I don't think this will have an effect on US regulation um, mm -hmm. at all, unfortunately. That's my assessment. Everything I'm saying here, by the way, is personal assessment, mm -hmm. top of mind, not necessarily the organization I work for. I just want to make that disclaimer. Mm -hmm. okay, if, um, if I can follow up on that a little bit. Um, right. we, we, we here, um, several years ago from one of your colleagues, he spoke to Network 2020, and I remember him saying at the time that, um, it, was, it was funny because so many of these talks are actually quite depressing, but I left his thinking I would be actually a little bit more uplifting. Um, but, but what he had to say, he, I remember him commenting on the fact that, we, you know, we started to see in the U.S. anyway, a lot of, um, a lot of states um, starting to do their own thing. Uh, you know, California, I think, is one in particular, uh, just because they're large, they have large economies, and they're you know, starting to band together with Canada or other countries and really looking at what they can do. Is that happening? Um, and is that a trend that you think would continue? Um, it's definitely happening. It's happening in the US and it's happening around the world. It's what we call sort of subnational efforts, subnational environmental efforts. Um, and yes, definitely in the US, there is a lot of states that have stricter regulation or more ambitious climate um, policies than, than the federal government. Um, the reason I'm maybe a little bit more pessimistic than my colleague was at that time, I still think that's great, but the current government is actually actively going after state authority to do so. So they are suing, the state government is suing California about their climate policy or their car standards. Now, this is going to be worked out in the courts, but if the, if the subnationals, uh, whether it's a state or a city, doesn't have the authority to set stricter standards than the federal standard, then of course their willingness is neither here nor there. Um, so to be decided, something we're working on, uh, really trying to help the states keep their authority, uh, but, uh, but it'll hinge on that. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so, so our next question is, is what, what can regular people do to try to maintain the environmental progress we have recently made once COVID-19 subsides? My soapbox, vote. <laughs> vote for um, pro-environment candidates, um, because as I said, what we need is structural change. We need change at the top that trickles down. Um, that's the single most important thing that anybody can do. Um, other things is obviously, you know, we vote with our pocket every day without sort of money every day, right? So um, what car you buy, what, uh, you know, what electricity you use, for instance, I mean, I'm, again, I'm in New York and um, I, I have green electricity. I could switch pain-free, took five minutes and I switched to green electricity. Um, stuff like that is helpful for sure, um, but it takes a lot of us to give the kind of signal that the government could give with one regulation. So I think we would, we would need both. And so, so I do, you know, voting, that's my, my soapbox thing. Please, please tell your, and if you're not voting, tell your regulators what you want. Write to the Senate, write to, you know, wherever country you are, whatever the regulatory body is there. Let them know that you're not happy with the status quo, that you are worried about your children and grandchildren. Um, so that would be my answer to that one. Thank you for that great question. All right, um, and, and just kind of a, a very minor um, side or, or follow up on that 
Um, and, and I recognize that that voting is is quite important. But uh, but I've been reading a bunch recently. I, I think Jonathan J Jonathan Safran Foer came out with uh, with an article about about you know the the, the need to reduce meat consumption. Um, is that something that you see playing into that, or would that just kind of take over into increased um, emissions from farming um, plant based foods? I mean, it's 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 definitely at the moment. Um, methane so there's different greenhouse gases and uh, methane um, is one that's emitted by livestock and it's a very very potent um, greenhouse gas so it's like 85 or 86 times more stronger than co2 in the short term so in the next 20 years co2 stays in the atmosphere a lot longer but methane is a lot stronger when it's first emitted um, what that means is we're trying to avoid the tipping points that are around the corner. So for that reason, really focusing on methane is really important. Um, meat, yes. And it is such a personal decision um, that um, what I think is really promising is that they are looking at different ways of feeding cattle. Um, that, that could be important. Um, obviously, we need to keep very vigilant about tropical deforestation so if, if if tropical deforestation was a country it would be the fourth is it fourth or fifth biggest emitter so it's basically the us china eu um and then it's then it's tropical deforestation it's huge um and so a lot of tropical deforestation is done for agricultural production either um grazing land or sort of palm oil and other other um, things. So it's, it, I mean, the, the agriculture is important, uh, but it's a very personal choice. And so I have always, am, although I'm vegetarian myself, I'm all, always reluctant to say to people, you, you should do this and it'll solve everything. Because um, I don't think that's, that's quite true. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So I'll, I'll continue back to the Q&A. So um, the next question is, uh, do you think the, do, do you think this will spark uh, the crisis will spark increased investment in alternative energy sources, given the impact of this crisis on oil prices. Well, unfortunately, the oil price is at an all-time low, right? So um, right now, if you're running on oil, you can just keep doing that. Um, again, I think this is a choice. It's going to be a structural choice. What we've seen is that renewable energy is competitive now. Um, we've seen big strides in technology and investment done over the past sort of 20, 30 years. Um, and so now is the time where it does make sense to start um, investing in alternative energy, renewable energy, but it's going to have to be a government choice. It's, it's not just, I mean, some of it is going to be led by the market because, because the prices have gone down. Uh, but it's also, you know, if, if there were a price on carbon, then, um, then everybody would do it you know, everybody would invest in renewable energy. So, um, and we're seeing a lot of um, pension funds and big investors starting to disinvest in uh, fossil fuels. Um, and so it does make sense, but with sort of a structural uh, change, like a carbon price, it would be a sort of um, much more of a given. So that's what we're working towards. Okay, and, and could you just, um, you know, really quickly to follow up, could could you give us a sense of where um, where the U.S. or where some of the states are in that um, process, uh, and, and you know what, whether you think that there is any any promise for for carbon pricing? Um, well, so there is carbon pricing um, in California, um, in northeastern states, um, sort of Washington, Oregon are eyeing it up. So statewide, there is a lot of. Um, sort of a lot of ambition happening in that in that room. Um, but as I said, so right now, uh, the California government is being sued for being connected to Canada, because I think there is some kind of, um, I mean, so certain, kind, certain states can do, they have state authority, but then once you connect with something, with um, a country, a state outside of your own country, it's, it changes. And so that's why they're being sued because they're connected to Canada. So, but yes, there is a lot of promising, um, a lot of promising uh, schemes happening um, in um, U.S. states right now. California being sort of the front runner in terms of the, the price and everything. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, all right, let's see. We'll turn back to the Q and A box then. Um, uh, let me see. 
is there is there any aspect of this of, of the current environmental progress that you think will actually carry on after the virus? Can you say that again of the environmental crisis? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, is there any aspect of this current environmental progress that you think will actually carry on after the virus? So, so, so I know you're, um, you know, maybe put on the rose-colored glasses again and see if there's anything that you think might actually continue. Yeah. Um, I think it'll depend on how long uh, the crisis will last. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful. Maybe with my rose-colored glasses, I would hope that um, citizens who are used to smog and now see blue skies will no longer take that as good enough and will say, look, we want that back. We've seen it's possible. Um, so yes, it's possible by, you know, no longer getting in your car, but it's also possible by driving an electric vehicle that is running on electricity generated in a renewable way. So it's not science fiction is what I'm trying to say. These things are possible and it doesn't have to mean that we all stop leaving the house it's just let's change the technology we're using and so i'm hopeful that now that people have seen what is possible that they will actually ask for it so that's my best rose colored glasses i can do great and then i guess you know anyone who is in the position of of being able to make make some changes even if it you know comes at a slight cost you know maybe that's Maybe that's the, the way to do it because I think it's also important not to underestimate the power that we can have on our own networks as well. So, oh, absolutely. Um, and I do think what I do think is that those of us who are fortunate enough to work home and basically have office jobs, I think even though it feels a little odd at times, we are all surprised about how resilient we've been and how we are just as productive as well. Maybe not just as productive, but quite productive. I'm lucky I don't have small kids. So, I, I do sort of feel for people with small kids, it's a bit harder. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, I don't think I will ever feel the need to go into the office again five days a week. Why would I? And um, I used to travel quite a bit, even though I'm an environmentalist, my flight footprint was quite bad. Um, I hope that that will be reduced forever. So I do think there are certain things that we are learning now about how we can communicate and connect to each other that will reduce our individual footprints and therefore a cumulative effect. So that I do think is true. Excellent, great. Okay, so our, our next question is about um, the future of the Paris Agreement. Um, so, so the person who's asking it wants to know what you think about the future of the Paris Agreement. And if the US with, withdraws from the Paris Agreement, will it give a way of developing another agreement? And to what extent uh, will those emission reducing policies be effective? Um, and what else can be done to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions? So, so a, a lot of small questions in there, but basically the questioner really wants to know about the future of the Paris Agreement and, um, and what, what could come after. Right. So, um, so the U.S. is due to leave the Paris Agreement officially, I think, the day after the U.S. elections. So um, if we see a sort of a Trump II presidency, that will definitely happen. If we see a Biden presidency, It'll still happen, but the Biden um, government would probably straight away from the 1st of January start the process to re-enter. Um, so again, there's like two big options, right? Um, if um, the US leaves, which is what sort of the default is, um, there is an opportunity for other countries to continue with more ambitious policies amongst them. Um, one of the great things about multilateralism is that you try to get agreement together and you all go in the same direction. One of the problems is that you often end up with the lowest common denominator, right? You need to do all these negotiations and everybody needs to agree. So there might be an opportunity there to really go for more ambition. Um, and there are countries, even within the Paris Agreement, there are smaller groups of countries that are trying to uh, be more ambitious and that are making subgroups and that are thinking of um, trading, for instance, doing emissions trading between them in sort of a more ambitious subgroup. So a lot to be seen how that's going to, to work out. Um, obviously, if, the, um, if there is a Biden administration, um, we hope that they will come into the Paris Agreement with a new ambitious NDC, uh, not just the NDC that was there before. Um, so that could be a really great thing. Um, so TBD and therefore vote. All right, excellent. We have a few more questions in the Q&A box. So let's see. Um... 
uh, let me sort of, uh, how optimistic do you feel about European leadership moving forward, especially with regards to the environment? And do you think the EU can become the global leader in the West if the US continues to renege on its duties on the environment and defense? Um, definitely. Very, very optimistic about the EU. Um, they have um, a new head of the commission um, who is very uh, pro-climate, pro-environment, and they have um, the European Green Deal um, that they are trying to negotiate right now um, with a net zero um, target by 2050. So very ambitious. They are currently negotiating what their 2030 targets would be, whether it would be 50 or 55 percent reduction, which again is also quite ambitious. Um, and yes, they 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 already are right now um, the global leader uh, when it comes to environment. Um, the question is whether it will be enough, right? I'm very optimistic about what the, the Europeans can do, um, but. Um, I think, you know, if the US is absent, it is a very big block to be absent. So that is worrying, so. Okay, all right. Well, that's, it sounds like, yeah, the, the we very much require leadership from, um, from the top and from, and from the US. So, um, so with that, I think we're, we're, we're questioned out. Um, so we'll, I think we'll, we'll, we'll give it a wrap, but, Britt, thank you very much for, for the, for, first of all, for the work that you do, and then second of all, for joining us today. I think, um, I think it was a really interesting conversation. Um, you know, for those of you who are listening, um, happy Memorial Day weekend to those in the U.S. Uh, we will be taking a break until next Thursday when our next conversation will be at 9 a.m. with Parag Khanna on um, shifting powers in the post-COVID-19 world. And, and for those of you who didn't catch this full conversation or who want to watch it again or want to tell a friend about it, it will be posted to our YouTube channel later. Um, so I just wanna thank you all for joining us and Britt especially, thank you so much. Um, and everyone have a, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Okay.